Hello? <laughs> Hello? Somebody left something called Skippy open on the laptop. Skippy? Yeah. I hope it's not a jar of peanut butter. W, <laughs> get over here. You left something open on the laptop. Wait, wait, come on. Hold on, hold on. How's, how's, you didn't mess with it, did you? No, I didn't mess with it. What are you doing? I was trying to order some uh, Baby Yoda on uh on Amazon.com. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, I, I didn't want anybody messing up. I got the spinning beach ball of death earlier. And I just, I, you didn't mess up my order, did you? Oh, I left it in the shopping cart. There's something called Skippy, and I hear people on the other end of it. <laughs> Who's that? Skippy. Hey, uh, it's uh, Jimmy and Jason from Rebel Force Radio, Sir Sean. I know those guys. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Christopher hey, Walken. You guys, you know, it's, it's crazy, but... I saw you uh, on the Rebel Force Radio. You have a, a YouTube uh, a video now, right? We yes, do. Yes. Yeah. It's cool. I you, like. You got to look into that, Chris. No, I, video. It's I'm a super eight man myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a film guy. Hey, hold on. Steven's around somewhere. I think he's washing his hands again. Yo, yeah. <laughs> you, you're washing your hands again. <laughs> I hope yeah, he's singing he happy was, birthday to you. He touched the refrigerator handle, and, uh, you know, every time he touches something in the house, you know, we're on lockdown together. It's kind of, we all got kind of, I had a book club meeting, and then, you know, we had to lockdown happen. You know, Governor of California, <laughs> right. not a big fan of his necessarily, but, uh, you know, <laughs> we're all here together now. Yeah, that's right. Drinking, eating, sleeping together, or trying to anyway. But. <laughs> You know, you know, Sir Sean. I was think you were one of the first I thought of when all of this broke uh, broke out. I hope that we've got armed guards around you at all times. You're too valuable to risk to the dreaded uh, virus. For the coronavirus, yes. Well, let me tell you something. Nobody's getting in here until we finish our Zorro marathon. We finally <laughs> got the DVDs. A little disappointed. It's not on Disney Plus. Yeah, but we had that uh, Mand Mandalorian. Uh, We've been watching that too. That's a, that's a good show. You guys ought to watch that. That's real Star Wars yes. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah we're we, looking we into have that. We've seen it. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we understand you are uh, our, our former president. Uh, you have, you have uh, a bout of Baby Yoda fever, from what I understand. I do have baby Yoda fever. I got. I try to get. Uh, there's there's a sidewalk collectibles. They got their version of it out there, and uh, I think there's uh, there's some kind of hot a toy that's hot. I guess it warms up or something. I, they got all kinds. I just need to collect them all, you know, because you know I'm a collector. I got. I went back in time, you know, with the W, you know, the with the TARDIS uh, RV. You probably don't remember that, that was a long time ago. With the book club <laughs> adventures, adventures of the book club. Adventures. <laughs> How how has Hollywood not picked up on this and made an Adventures of the Book Club film? Because I mean, the marquee would look amazing with with Christopher Walken, former President of the United States George W. Bush, and of course the great Sir Sean Connery, who would come out of retirement to shoot the film. I would absolutely come out of retirement to do that. Except these clowns over here, they couldn't remember their dialogue. They screw up the scenes. They, oh, it's just, it's terrible having to try to hole up with these two. These three, if Stephen would ever come to the phone, your Skippy call is going on. We're over here trying to handle it for you. I just got the Skippy. <laughs> Well, certainly uh, his hands must be uh, washed and cleaned by now, right. dried off. So yeah. maybe we could talk to Mr. Stanton. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you so much. for. Uh, <laughs> were they uh, giving you guys a rough time? Well, a little bit, a little bit. But um, I, I think it was the technology. My Amazon.com uh, order. That's what happened. As I was ordering a baby Yoda from Sidewalk Collectibles, and Eastbell was coming. All right, it's okay. It's, uh, <laughs> we'll take care of that later. Gentlemen, it has been wow. way too long. Wow, it has. Yes. Even um, Stanton, for real, this time. Yeah, these guys, they can go. They're back. They're watching something on uh, Disney+. Plus. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's uh, there's an episode about mummies on uh, Discovery or National Geographic or something. Oh, on. man, you put W in front of Disney+. Plus. You're not going to see him for months. <laughs> well, that's good. We like that. You know, it's kind of keeps them busy. Keeps them busy. Yeah, I used to put my kids in front of the TV and turn on Teletubbies. I'm sure it has the same effect. 
Yeah, that and My Little Pony. For some reason, W really gets into that. He's old school with that. No, he's a brony. He's a brony. He is a brony. He's yeah. totally a brony. Well, and, Stephen and, and is, is not ashamed to admit it. it is. No, absolutely not. He touts it. It's great <laughs> to have you. As you say, it has been far too long. And uh, speaking of keeping busy, you've been keeping busy. You're always keeping busy. And I would imagine that uh, having this, this new incredible an exciting season of uh, Star Wars, The Clone Wars, bittersweet as it may be, as it you know wrapped up uh, just a few days ago. That's got to be a, a thrilling uh, conclusion to an adventure that started for you back in uh, 2008, I believe. Yeah, you know, back in, back in season two, uh, Duchess of Mandalore, when I came on board as Masa Meda, a lot, uh, a lot has happened since the, that very first episode. And uh, yeah, it is, it's, it, it was it was wild to hear that they were bringing it back. Uh, we certainly didn't expect, uh, at least I didn't expect, uh, you know, uh, them to ever resurrect the series. But uh, I'm so glad they did because, uh, especially that last arc in particular, they just really pulled out the stops. Along, along, uh, it's been a, it's a it's been a long road from that very first Clone Wars movie in those that early season one. Oh, for sure. Well, you know, you, and, and you, you could see it. You could see it in the quality alone. You can just, you know, with with bare naked eyeballs, take note of the advancements in the animation over all the years. Yeah, you know that first episode, or well, not the first episode, the first season. You, you, we saw how you know we had uh, you know hair that didn't move. And remember when all of a sudden the hair would move with the wind? Oh yeah, it, are you kidding? It, it, we 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 threw a party. Noticed that stuff. Yeah, I threw a block party when that happened and invited all of my neighbors uh, and uh, local business owners and uh, clergymen, local clergymen even stopped by. The excitement was in the air once that hair started moving. But of course, Stephen, you remember us here on Rebel Force Radio were the ones who were yelling and screaming for that because I always said that when they were going through these fast action sequences, I noticed this in season one when Anakin was on top of this train and his hair was as solid as, 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 as like a wood carving. I said that it's betraying George Lucas's faster, more intense mantra. Now I know that's something he just said to actors and stuff, but I always assumed that was sort of his overall philosophy for star Wars storytelling uh, especially in the visu visual medium. And uh, so sure enough, Dave Filoni, uh, they, they fixed their tooling so the hair would be able to, to move. And he's always given our podcast credit for that. And then you notice Anakin Skywalker in the last episode, his hair is flowing in the wind like he uh, just used the best conditioner in the galaxy. <laughs> so it was bouncing and behaving. And um, if anyone remembers that old commercial, bouncing and behaving, uh, you know, the girls would walk around with their hair to be bouncing and behaving. Is that Breck or Claire all? Yeah, or? It was one of those, right? <laughs> remember? It was like a but commercial you know, campaign from the early 80s, I think. Well, you know, but, a lot a lot changed in that, you know, that first uh, first season. One of the things that they did uh, that's a little different from once they you know, sort of locked down their whole pre-visualization uh, sort of uh, structure was that uh, in the very first episode that I was in, they would uh, they would just film. I'm going to use filming terms. They would film everything on the page, record everything on the page, and they would animate it as well. And then they would just edit it like a film and cut out scenes where it was too long because that uh, first uh, episode I worked on, if you look on the Blu-ray for that season in the Jedi Temple archives, there's like, I think, three scenes that were cut from that episode with Masa Meda, and they're all completely animated. And I asked Dave about that one time, and he said, yeah, he said, we don't, we don't have to do that anymore because we've gotten better with our previs, but in the early days, he said, we would just go ahead and just animate the whole thing and then cut it, edit it like a film. Well, Stephen, I mean, as somebody that has worked on not just this series, but a, a huge variety of uh, television and film projects, you know how the sausage gets made, yet... You seem to be as blown away as any Star Wars fan about the last four episodes of the Clone Wars. So uh, is, it, is it hard to separate yourself as the seasoned professional that knows that the, how this stuff comes together versus the Star Wars fan that is uh, excited to see these, these stories finally being told? Yeah, I think both of those uh, both of those parts of my personality in play when I'm doing these things because on the one hand, you know, you're you're there and you're recording and you've got in your mind, you know, what did, what did season five look like? And that's what you're kind of expecting. 
And then, uh, you know, I had no idea how they had retooled, you know, their their palette and, you know, the, all the tools that, uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody like Keith Kellogg and Joel Aaron and all Joel Aaron and all those guys have. And then when I saw the final, you know, the final product, I was uh, I was just I was just amazed. I was really knocked back because when I was working on this, I didn't see very much. You know, a lot of times uh, we'll be called in to do pickup lines and ADR to finished animation. They'll they'll change some dialogue or something like that. So we're we're looping just like you would in a live action film. But I didn't really have a chance to do that in this. Uh, in this particular uh, arc, so I didn't see what any of it looked like, other than what Marg Krim, what his model sheet looked like, uh, and his design upgrade. But that's all I saw, so it was a surprise to me. You know, I've seen those animatics online, like you guys did a couple years ago, when they put the Bad Batch online and all that stuff. I had no idea where it was going to end up going, though. Yeah, for sure. Now, Mark Krim, he, of course, is a new character that you uh, bring voice to. He is a uh, a pike. A pike. Do you have any um, information about the pikes and how they were developed for the Clone Wars? Because I think the reason I'm asking, Stephen, is because I think they had their origins originally in story treatments for George Lucas's live action Star Wars television show. Do you have any insight into that and in into the origin of the pikes? No, I, I don't really. I mean, when I got called in for this back in 2012, which is when, you know, we originally recorded this, uh, Dave, pretty much what he told me in shorthand was like, you know, I had asked him, I didn't know anything about the Pikes, and I had asked him if they were new characters. He said, no, they'd been used before. And um, uh, so I said, well, what are we looking for on a voice on this? And he said he wanted something that was kind of like a Don Corleone type of uh, Godfather thing. So. Yeah. You know, I took that, uh, you know, the Don Corleone, and I took the cotton out of his mouth, you know, and he uh, became, uh, you know, Mark Krim, you know, that that kind of a wow. guy that was in, you know, in charge more, of this more, more the De Niro for, uh, Vito Corleone than the <laughs> yes, Brando Corleone. Yes. Yeah, he was he was kind of a mixture, but uh, he was, and there was um, a lot of that that particular arc. Boy, did that go through an evolution from 2012 to what we ended up seeing on the screen. In uh, in 2020, um, there was you know there's a lot. This arc has been talked about. I think it's celebration and uh, you know as Ahsoka's walkabout arc. It was a really important uh, arc. It actually happened in the beginning of season six. That's when it was originally you know if I look at my episode numbers, it was one of the first arcs in season six, and it was written originally by Charles Murray, who wrote the. Uh, I always call it the trial of Ahsoka, on, uh, Ahsoka Tano arc at the end of season five. So he wrote those final episodes, and then they got him to write these, these four. And Charles is an excellent writer. You know, he was a executive producer on Luke Cage and a writer on that show, writer on Sons of Anarchy. He's a you know does a lot of live action stuff. And his original treatment of this thing had something very different than what most people. Uh, are aware of it was it was a um, it wasn't the it was there was something else even before the Nix Okami character came in there was other characters that Ahsoka Tano was um, was dealing with and that's I'm going to let Dave Filoni if he ever decides to tell who those characters were but I believe part of the reason they had to change it as much as they did is that uh, Star Wars canon in 2020 is very different from Star Wars canon in uh, 2012, and I don't think it would have been possible to do those original scripts. It would have been trying to shoehorn in too much to what we already know. So I'll kind of leave it at that. <laughs> but it was a uh, it was an important arc just because it was about how the people in the lower levels of Coruscant feel about the Jedi and uh, getting Ahsoka involved with those people down there and finding what people really think about the jedi which is they don't think much of them so like i said it, it went through a huge uh, evolution one day i hope uh, dave will talk about its original because my scripts that i have at home actually have the original character names in there and, if, and like if we were to show those to people you're like you got to be kidding that's what was going on but you know they like i said i don't you think it tease was you how dare you? I mean, they, they, they came like up that. with the characters of trace and rafa and i and i really enjoyed working with bridget collie and Elizabeth Rodriguez, they were both uh, great. And, uh, you know, I got to work with Ashley again. And I always love 
being able to uh, terrorize Ashley Eckstein with one of my characters, <laughs> whether it's Tarkin or in this case it was Marg Crim. So it was kind of like uh, like a, a nice uh, high school reunion there with like you know getting back to being the evil guy that's got to terrorize everybody in the galaxy. <laughs> well, of course, Tarkin is the one who threw the book at Ahsoka there at the end of season five. And yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, so that that. You know, must have pro- that probably would have been your biggest moment playing Tarkin in the Clone Wars because I think we're seeing a Tarkin very familiar with the character that we know in the original trilogy. So, I mean, just forgetting all about the work you did as Tarkin in Rebels, which is obviously much closer to A New Hope, just right. focusing solely on Clone Wars and a Tarkin who is working within the realm of the Republic instead of the Empire. I think this is the, the, the time we really see him starting to come into his own during that trial of Ahsoka. We really see the potential of future Tarkin in those sequences. He's very authoritarian, and he's very by-the-book, and he's very stern, and he is uh, very absolute in his... Um, thought process yeah dave Uh, told me when we were doing those episodes uh, he said this is this is his power grab this is where he really decides that he's going to go for it and you know there was a scene i don't know if i ever discussed this with you guys or not there was a scene that was cut or i should say rewritten where essentially um tarkin turns the tables on uh, ahsoka tano during the trial you know how in the beginning of that episode he tells the jedi it's like look if you don't eject her from the jedi people are going to think this is a biased uh, trial so he says you should really you know like kick her out and then at the end during the there was a speech that that came during the you know that uh, trial that like i said was rewritten and he pretty much says well if you're so innocent why did the jedi themselves reject you from their order you know he and everyone's like oh my gosh he just he's just screwed us over <laughs> did it publicly <laughs> and everything but uh, they, they ended up rewriting that and uh, putting it and shortening that whole thing. But I thought it was a great moment because it really showed how, uh, how two-timing Tarkin can actually be. You know, when I was watching uh, The Rise of Skywalker and saw Richard E. Grant's character, uh, General Pride, uh, you know, it was, it was clear to me that he was sort of uh, based on Tarkin. And so I started thinking about the differences between those characters, you know, and at one point you see him, you know, on his knees, uh, practically worshiping uh, the uh, hologram of the emperor. And I started thinking about Tarkin and whether or not he was a true believer in in the, uh, you know, more of the, the, the spiritual, the mystical aspects of the empire or if he was just. Uh, you know, an authoritarian military man. Have you ever given any thought to that, Stephen, about what made that character uh, tick and why he was able to just fit into the uh, Imperial ranks so well coming out of the, the Republic? Well, yeah, you know, if you ever read, I don't know if you've ever read Tarkin by James Lucino, the novel, uh, he lays out a lot of that in the in the novel. You know, Tarkin has he's got his reservations about, you know, the Empire, or excuse me, the Emperor and all this sort of force jazz you know but he kind of goes along with it because his ambition is to move up in the ranks if you read about his childhood which they they cover in the book you know how they his uncle takes him onto this uh, you know this jungle part of this jungle planet and he's got to survive out there on his own uh you know they you know comes out bloody and everything else he's you know his family was on a, a planet that they were trying to tame and they were you know kind of ruling the planet with an iron fist and that was his sort of you know, that's his upbringing. So he kind of carried the whole thing about fear being the way to get people mm-hmm. to get what you want from people. He carried that with him right from his childhood. Um, and there's some great scenes in um, in Tarkin where, you know, the emperor is summoning him off the uh, the base where they're building the, the Death Star. And he's like, oh, I got to go leave this now. What does he want? You know, it's I'm, I got important stuff I'm trying to do. And the emperor wants to talk to me. And, you know, Masa made is like, uh, he wants you to talk you want you to meet with vader and he's like vader that guy oh yeah you know (laughs) it's like what does he want me to do with him we don't really get along that well these days he's got his way of doing things i've got my way of doing things and the emperor puts them together purposely because he wants them to learn how to work together Mm. (laughs) yeah it's kind of having the for for palpatine it's sort of having 
the best of both worlds. Because, you know, uh, I think it's the, the, the Snoke that talks about how when he's uh, manipulating Hux, you know, what a what a sharp tool uh, a guy like Hux can be. So you can see how, you know, if, if, if Snoke is a proxy for Palpatine, how useful these Imperial types might be without having all of that force baggage and all of that. You know, there can only be two anyway. But right. he is, he is, I think, uh, grown for me to be one of the more interesting and fascinating characters. And then, you know, for him to show up in Rogue One, a film that you also had a role in, you were uh, Admiral Raddus. And, right. you know, I, I, I look, there's been a lot said about uh, Star Wars post the Disney acquisition. But one thing that seems to rise to the top is that a lot of fans... And I might even say the majority of fans, based on the feedback we get at Rebel Force Radio, consider Rogue One to be the best Star Wars film in the uh, Disney era. Well, what I love about it, and, you know, and there's a lot that I do love about it, is it's you're, you get to travel back to 1977, but you get to see it all done with like modern visual effects and filmmaking techniques and the kinds of things that audiences are used to now. When I went in on that recording session, I remember Matt Wood was you know, trying to give me some context of some of the scenes that I was recording dialogue for. So he would show me like a little bit of something ahead of my scene and then a little bit of something afterwards. And he was showing me some of the uh, restored footage they had of the, uh, the, uh, the, the squadron of X-Wing pilots from the 1977 film. And I about just you know, <laughs> jumped out of my skin right there at the session. I said, I couldn't, couldn't believe that they were going to do that. And I told him, I said, oh, my God, people are just going to freak out when they see this old footage from 1977 in this new film. And it's just, you know, it was, there was so much excitement about that. Um, on the second day that I was in there recording, um, this group of people came in, you know, they kind of like, it's a little bit of an interruption. We were between takes. Uh, so this one gentleman came in, he had like three or four other people with him. And uh, they talked to Matt Wood and Doc Kane, you know, who was our recording uh, engineer on that. And then they kind of just stood behind me and we were getting ready to go. And I'm like, well, who, who are these people? No one's introducing me or anything. So I turned around to the, the man standing behind me. I said, hi, I, I'm Steven. I said, and, and you are? He goes, oh, Ryan, Ryan. I'm like, oh, okay. And at that time, I didn't know, I had never seen a photo of Ryan Johnson. So I didn't know that that's who was standing behind me while I was recording Admiral Raddus. But he was on the lot probably already working on his film. But there, I think there was just a lot of excitement and interest in Rogue One. People were just stopping by to see what they were working on. But it was great to meet him. He was a nice guy. Was Gareth Edwards or Tony Gilroy in this recording session as well? The, everybody that was directing me was doing it remotely from London. So uh -huh. they were all over there. And so I didn't get to see anybody face to face. So it was mainly, you know, Matt Wood was with me in the studio at, at Disney on the lot with mm -hmm. um, with Doc Kane. And, uh, you know, that's that's pretty much the way we did it for both days that I that I went in there. And, and it's funny because when I auditioned for this role, I had no idea what I was auditioning for. Once again, that sort of secrecy that Lucasfilm has around stuff. Sure. They were just saying they were looking for this military character that was a cross between uh, Patton and uh, Winston Churchill. And so I went in and I listened to like all right, some voice reference of Churchill. And then I went and listened to, to General Patton. And I'm thinking, wow, he has kind of a mild sort of eastern seaboard type of voice. And I thought, you know who they're really probably thinking of? They're thinking of George C. Scott. Ah, uh, uh, right. Sure. So of I course. Took, you know, George C. Scott and yeah. Winston Churchill, and I took, you know, put the two together, and you get Admiral Radish, and, and you know, submitted that audition. And then, you know, I, I got it, and I still didn't know what it was, you know, what this character looked like or anything. It wasn't, it's, you know, the script said it was for a movie called Los Alamos, uh, on the, even on my ADR <laughs> pages, which was the code name for it. And when I got there, Matt Wood finally showed me a picture. I said, oh, he's Mon Cal, you know, Mon Cal, okay. Great. Now I know what we're doing. <laughs> so you had to take you had to take uh, George C. Scott and imagine him, you know, underwater, all gurgly and doing that. That <laughs> well, I'm dry thing. land, you know, more gasping for breath. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, you know. But yeah, that was the, you know that was the whole genesis of of that particular you know that character. It's always interesting to find out what it is you're working on when you finally get to a Star Wars project. <laughs> so true. Now, so. Um, 
the voice of Admiral Akbar didn't influence the sound of Admiral Raddus at all because I, I hear some Akbar in there as well. I think that's just a coincidence because, like I said, I didn't know what I was auditioning for. So mm. I just did that sort of George C. Scott and Winston Churchill thing. Mm. And, you know, it kind of came out that way. And I guess pro- that's probably what they were looking for was, you know, something in that vein, you know, Shades that gravelly that. voice. Well, Stephen, we've, we've attempted to compile the names of all of the characters that you have played in the Star Wars universe. Uh, and I'm sure that we left some out. Um, so I just wanted to throw some names at you and uh-huh. you give me, and, and it's okay. Look, you've, you're, a, you're an extremely prolific uh, uh, voice actor, screen actor, all of that. So it's totally forgivable. If you forget a character, no one's going to hold it against you. <laughs> All right. Certainly no one listening to this show, but I am curious. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when we when we throw out some of these these uh, character names? And uh, how about um, Morala with all? Oh, yes. Well, first thing that comes to mind with that is Circus Peanuts and Old Spice. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) You guys know about uh, Uncle Uncle Morala's bedtime stories. That's the first thing. Uh Uh-huh. Morallo Evol, or as Jimmy likes to call him, Morallo. Morallo. Well, that's how you call him in Chicago. You call him Morallo. Yeah. (laughs) No, he was that crazed bounty hunter. You know what I love about Morallo Evol is that... um, See, I think more people have gotten the wind of the fact that that whole plot, that whole arc, is pretty much what happens at the beginning of the Revenge of the Sith. That's them. That's that whole plot to try to kidnap, you know, the Chancellor. But it just mm. it goes it goes awry, you know. So they try it again, Revenge of the Sith. Oh, yeah. It's, that, it's the same right. sort of thing. It's like they tried it once. They had used you know Cad Bane and Morallo Evol and that whole group, and it just you know the whole thing flew, fell apart. Yeah. But, but you I'm never sure. let a good idea go to waste. No, so no, no. You know, <laughs> Dooku is consistent, if nothing else. You right. Know? Well, how about um, Viscous? Does Viscous <laughs> ring any bells? Oh, yeah. From the, 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 the Night Sisters. Yes, the, yes, the, uh, at the Gladiator School. Ah, yes. Come see what we have for sale today. You know, that, um, <laughs> that guy. He was kind of creepy. Um, you well, you know, you, you got a thing going with some of these creepy characters: Morala, Evol, uh, Viscous. Um, you know, Tarkin's got always, a creepy vibe too. I don't, and I had, and, you know, not knowing what the character was like originally, I always had pictured him in my mind as the sort of uh, Peter Ustinov character, as head of the Gladiator School in Spartacus. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a more comedic role. It turned out not to be. So. Right. Yeah. Um, all right, let's see. Let's um, we're gonna we'll, we'll skip around a little bit. Um, how about Edsel Bar Gain? Does that yeah, sound familiar? Yeah, he's a senator. I think he has like one scene. I think in I don't know. There which are no episode. small parts, Stephen. No, no it's parts. not. But I'm saying he only has. You know, he's in one of those guys who's trying. He's, they, they, it's they're getting ready to. It's one of those scenes. I'm sure Romasa Meda has said, "Order, order, we must take a vote." Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> one of those. It's because that's <laughs> Masa Meda is usually telling people, "Order, order." Yeah, he loves that. He loves it. He can't get enough of it. That's why they hired him. I remember what he looks like. He's kind of Edsel Bargain. He's kind of bluish white. He's bald. He's got these sort of like solid sort of like, you know, Area 51 looking alien eyes. Well, you know, what's interesting is uh, while we're talking about all of these great characters you played, uh, recently StarWars.com released an older interview featuring Dave Filoni and George Lucas talking about the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. It was it was a little live thing they did for uh, people who worked at Lucas Animation. And uh, I'm not really 100% sure when this interview happened. They were being very coy about it on the website. But I, it's older for sure. And uh, George Lucas actually revealed his favorite Clone Wars episode of all time. And uh, Jason, I don't know if you caught this. But I, I do have an audio clip here that I sent you, or I could just play it from my no, I end. I, I think you have it. Okay, great. So um, here's George Lucas revealing his favorite all-time Clone Wars episode, and it does have something to do with you, Mister Stan. One second, while Jason gets the audio ready. 
Please stand by. Your call is important to us. Please yeah, stand on. by. <laughs> or I could just play it from my end if that makes things no. easier. No, it's fine. Here it is. Well, let's try it one more time. All operators are busy right now. The episodes we did, if you ask my favorite, were the ones that were the least like any of the movies because that's when we were actually being creative and challenging ourselves and doing things that felt more like Star Wars. Well, my favorite, <laughs> I can remember. Really? I'm yeah, frightened. It's, it's the one with the droids. Oh, when they're out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> oh, my God, really? It's, uh, it's THX <laughs> White Limbo in Star Wars Land. That one's up there because who in the world would make that? <laughs> <laughs> Who would? Who? <laughs> well, George yes, Lucas would, and he's referring to, of course, uh, Sunny Day in the Void from Season 5 of Star Wars The Clone Wars, featuring a Stephen Stanton original character, M Mieber Gaston. Kerm Colonel <laughs> Mieber Gaskin. Gaskin is his name. Colonel Mieber Gascon is the way we oh. say it here, soldier. Gascon. Okay, G Gascon. Gaskin. Mieber Gaskin. Gaskin. Meber Gaskin. Yes, yeah, so I, I put a little. I put a little George W. Bush into my uh, pronunciation of that name. But yeah, Meber Gascon. Yes, he is a character that definitely split the audience uh, right in two with that arc. I tell you, as far as the the uh, the the like and dislike for that character in that arc in general. Yeah. But I'm not surprised that George liked it because even when I, you know, when I I had seen the, you know a preview of it, they had given me a preview copy of it to to look over, and. Uh, you know, as I saw, you know, uh, uh, Abafar, I'm like, this is THX. This is Mobius. This is right up George Lucas's alley. You know, this sort of white, you know, limbo background that goes to nowhere. You guys have seen THX 1138. Oh, of course. Many, many times. You know, and uh, so, yeah, I wasn't, I'm not surprised to hear that. But it definitely was, um, that was, uh, I can't remember. I think it was on your guys' list of the most best uh, of, of your favorite Clone Wars too, right? I think I remember you guys saying how much well, you loved those episodes. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I, I don't know about that, Mr. Stan, but I'll tell you this. Uh, I, I did grow a little tired of some of the criticisms I was hearing of that episode in particular, and uh, I came up with the uh, saying to protect our favorite Colonel Mieber Gascon. I said, Lay off the gas. That's right. That's right. That's I remember what lay I off the gas. That's no, it, right. it was it was one of those characters that for me was a lot of fun to do because it was so different and he was so well rounded. I mean, there was you know because of the, whenever you do the droid voices, you know it's the same thing I had to do in Star Wars Rebels as AP five. You know the droid says something to you and droid speak and then you repeat it back. What do you mean they're going to be late? You know that's so you just say back what they they said. But you know that's why they put uh, the character of Whack in there so the Gascon would actually have somebody to talk to. But the big thing that I loved about that episode, I'm sure you guys agree, is the introduction of uh, the clone commando, Gregor. Oh, yes. Dee Baker's, yes. Uh, you know, right. the guy who'd lost his memory. That was just, I had so much fun working with D on that because it was so mm -hmm. different from anything else they had done in the show with clones. And I didn't usually get a chance to have a lot of scenes working with D Baker. So this was, you know, this was a very small cast on this. There was usually, at the most, three people in the room. Most of the time, there was just two. So it was it was a great one to explore that whole whole thing of Gregor getting his his memory back and then really switching into high gear at the end of that episode. Yeah, you know, earlier uh, on the uh, show, Stephen, we were we were talking about a, an article that was in uh, Vanity Fair, and it was John Favreau and Dave Filoni. They were talking about the uh, journey to bring Baby Yoda to the screen, and one of the things Baby they Yoda, were, I love Baby Yoda. Yeah, yeah right, big that. hit, big hit in the household there. Uh, and they were talking about you know the, the the struggle that they had to to not make him too cute, and something that uh, Favreau said was he said you know George established with Star Wars a universe where no matter how fantastical these characters are, how weird they look, the characters within the world always treated them as normal citizens citizens of the world. And you think about these extreme characters, and Mieber Gascon is one of those that was so extreme, yet he was this. He was this, uh, you know, big top general. Well, yeah, to that me, only makes sense in Star Wars. A absolutely, there's there's no way you can have a character like that and, and and much else and have it be accepted by the audience. And I thought there was a lot of parallels. You know, I, I I've, I've yet to talk to Brent Friedman. Wrote that arc. He also wrote the Moralo Evol arc as well. 
he seemed to get all the the strange assignments, the difficult ones. And you know, there was I, I always thought there was a correlation between, uh, or at least a similarity between Meber of Gascon and Lawrence of Arabia. They were both map makers who were like thrust into greatness or had greatness thrust upon them. You know, one's going to Aqaba, the other one's going to Abafar. Oh. Out in the, they're both desert places. I didn't know if there was anything about that, but I always thought that was kind of a an interesting, he was kind of like the anti Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> you know, wow. he wanted the glory, but he just wasn't equipped to do it. You know, well, I think you're on to something with that. I think we should, we need to do a full on deconstruction of <laughs> Sunny Day in a Void. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I did actually uh, watch those episodes recently upon hearing George's comments about them. And, and there is something very, uh, amazing about those episodes that make up them very original when you compare it to a lot of the other star Wars catalog. And of course the THX 1138, um, comparisons were made by you and George Lucas himself that, that, uh, individual walking through the white void of an environment, the environment being a reflection of the madness going on inside the character's head. Yeah. And, <laughs> and while in THX 1138, um, Duvall, Bobby Duvall, he uh, he uh, internalized internalized a lot of that stuff, but with Meber Gas Gascon Gascon, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with names tonight. If you haven't noticed, Meber Gascon, uh, he really wears that stuff on his sleeve, and he let it all hang out. When oh he, yeah, uh, he went nuts. Was was that a lot of fun for you to portray a character slipping into madness like that? Well, it was because you never know how far they want to go. There's only so much written on the page, you know, then it'll say like, you know, then Gascon, you know, like loses his mind or starts jumping around. And I would try something and then Dave would say, no, no, I think Looney Tunes go even bigger, broader, just go crazy with it. You know, and and you're not, you know, you're used to playing Clone Wars a certain way. So, you know, trying to keep that frame of mind. And it's great when you have someone, you know, like Dave that really knows what he wants and says, no, no. Here's where we're going with this, just cut loose. It's something you definitely have to keep in mind. Like when we were doing Star Wars Resistance, uh, that was made for a much younger audience. So, you know, we're keeping certain things in mind while we we're portraying those. And right at the time that I was working on Resistance, we went back to starting to work on Clone Wars. And I remember asking Dave, because he was directing me in my Clone Wars episodes. I said, so this is like still like keeping kids in mind? And Dave's like, hmm. <laughs> Not so much. Yeah, you know, good. This is more, you know, because it's it's written. Because if you were to read a script from Star Wars Resistance, there isn't anything necessarily in the script that would say, okay, this is a a, a show for a younger audience. They're written just like Star Wars, but it's the way it's you know, Resistance was animated and it was acted out a certain way, and the timing and everything like that, color palette, it, it all came together in the end to be something like uh, a show for younger people. But if you were to read the scripts. If I were to just hand them to you and not tell you what show it's from, you wouldn't know it was Star Wars Resistance. It's all Star Wars. But it's just like, how do we play it out? So once we were doing Resistance and I was going back to Clone Wars, I had to get into that darker place again where, you know, you're just being more evil and menacing and not worrying about if you're scaring the audience or not. Wow. S Steven, I have to ask, you know, we've interviewed in, in a lot of different uh, actors associated with Star Wars and, and a lot of voice talent. And that are involved in a lot of different projects. Your ability to recall character names, descriptions, the writers, the writers of the episode. I think you're the first, you may be the first and only actor from an animated Star Wars project who can throw out the names of the writers, you know, even if their names aren't, you know, those names aren't Dave and Filoni. What is it? <laughs> is that just something you've just always had the ability to do? Or are you that studious about the projects you get involved in where you you follow the careers of all these people and and you notice the patterns and other things that they're involved in or you just have like a photographic memory no it's more about uh more respect for the writer and what they do and you know i've been on worked on both sides of the camera and you know in production and, and as an actor and i understand how important writers are. If you don't have writers, you don't have a show yeah. or a film or anything. You just don't have it. So when I would get, you know, whenever I was working on something, I was always looking, what's, what's the byline? Who's, who wrote the script that I'm working on today? And if they were in the studio, many times they were, but they would sit in the back and be very quiet. 
I would go introduce myself to people like Charles Murray or become good friends with Brent Friedman. I mean, that guy has written some of the for, for Rebels and Clone Wars, all of my most controversial re- uh, episodes, like <laughs> AP5, Singing in Space. Guys, I'm sure <laughs> oh, that's yeah. on your list wow. as well. Wow. You know? Were they the existential droid? Yes. He was yeah, wow. that was that was a very uh, interesting episode of uh, Rebels I there. So, uh, yeah, so I, I've really oh, come to the know s- who these people are and, you know, uh, Matt Michnovich and, you know, Stephen Melching, all these people. I'll have them sign my scripts for me and, you know, everything. I, you know, I just, I want something to remember what these guys have done, you know, and they, they put a lot into this. I mean, every show is going to get criticized, you know, this episode wasn't as good as that one, or this one is considered filler, but, you know, nobody goes into these things saying like, oh, I just got to crank this out, you know, and get it done so they can shoot it tomorrow. I mean, I've been on episodes, I'll tell you, I can tell you exactly the one. The Clone Wars arc that I just finished recording, when we did that originally, they were still working on it the day that I was acting. They were up like in a conference room at the studio and they were coming down like, okay, we got the scripts. The names are not going to be right. Just ignore them. Those characters aren't in this anymore. <laughs> you know. And then David mm. explained well, you know, the whole evolution of why, it, why those characters' names were in there and all that stuff. But they were working on them right up to the last minute. You know, they don't. They, they, everybody involved at Lucasfilm on these animated shows that I've been on takes it, you know, as serious as a, as a heart attack. Yeah. When you guys would would show up for your recording sessions, you'd be waiting in the lobby, and that's when they would hand out the scripts, and you guys would just sit there and start flipping through the scripts right there in the lobby. So it's not like you really had much lead time going into these performances to begin with. Well, that that wasn't always the case. Um, uh, when you know, when every you know, most of the time they would have them delivered to your home. Uh, that a, a delivery person would drop off the script to your home, and you'd have it in advance. But there were times I remember I, the Moralo Evol arc is one of those because I got there early, and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're gonna they're gonna kill off uh, Obi Wan Kenobi. Wait, what what's going on in this <laughs> script? You know, uh, there was all kinds of stuff you know in there that was just a surprise. But most of the time, you know, I would say generally we got uh, got the scripts in advance. You know, and it was only on rare occasions that we would get them right there. Now, in some cases, when you would be like hired at the last minute, they said, oh, we need you to come in on Thursday. You're going to be playing a new character. Scripts will be at the session. And then you're like, okay, what are we doing? And then, you know, Dave would say, okay, I want you to be this character. This is the way we're going to go about it. What have you got? And then you'd kind of work it out right there. What was the biggest difference for you personally between working on – the productions of Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and then going into Star Wars Rebels. Did you notice a big difference in the approach or anything like that? Or was it uh, feeling more or less like an extension of The Clone Wars? No, it was it was definitely an extension. You know, I, one of my touchstones, of course, was the fact that uh, every time I would go on to a new series, D. Baker would be there. So I always had somebody that I knew mm. that was... Uh, there and in some you know but i also made new friends you know like freddie prince jr i really got to know him well working on rebels and he was a fun person and a great actor and got to work with steve bloom and so you know you sort of started getting this new family i would say you know that from a technical standpoint the way lucasfilm does things there was absolutely no interruptions it was a smooth transition the thing that i missed was not having dave filoni there at every session because he had a way of doing things he would tell stories you know and i would always you know i would always get him going i'd I'd come up with some question i'd say like dave like when uh you know when a when a when a jedi dies who gets his lightsaber and dave's like ah all right let me tell you about that and let me tell you what george (laughs) said and we go into his 20 minute you know discussion or i'd say like well how come the sith you know, is there any possibility that we're ever going to see like Sith Force ghosts? And like, no, never. And here's why, you know. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, and eventually, you know, the producer would say, okay, Dave, we got to get started recording on this, you know. But it was always just fun to talk Star Wars with him because he would just do it. He would go there. He would give you as much information as he possibly could. I remember one time early on, I said, what's the name of this galaxy that we're all living in? Mm. And somebody, nobody seemed to have a, an answer. Someone said, call Pablo. At the at Lucasfilm, and in those days, I didn't know who Pablo was, uh, so I said, "Okay, they're going to call Pablo." And they, a few minutes went went by, and they said, "We heard back from from Pablo. He says he says the galaxy you're all living in is called Far Far Away." Yeah, no, that makes sense. From a galaxy 
far, far away. Yeah. Okay, so I get it. That's about as close ha, as I got to an answer on that. <laughs> ha ha ha, Pablo. Ha ha. Yeah, but, it, but it was, it was, you know, it was, it was. That was the one thing I missed was just having Dave there. I mean, it was great working with everybody, uh, you know, that was on Rebels and on Resistance. But it was nice when I finally went back to Clone Wars, the first episode that I did. Uh, I did by myself. Occasionally, I'll record by myself, depending on people's schedules and stuff. And so it was just me in the room by myself and Dave Filoni directing. It was just a, a wonderful experience. It was great to be sort of, sort of like back in that mode again. And, you know, mm. have him give me you know, the, the Filoni touch, so to speak, on the nice. whole script and the story. I, I have heard very... that phrase before, the Filoni touch. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah, in a creepy a, way. I'm, I, no, no, no. It's like the, it's the, the thing that he touch, adds uh, to these recording There's all recording kinds of directors, and, you know, that yeah. have their put their imprint on things. That's right. You know, and Dave just has a way of doing it. Like when I was doing Star Wars Rebels, you know, everybody kind of knew that Dave was doing the voice of Chopper, but he would not fess up to it. And the, when I had to do my first episode as AP5, so I'm sitting there. So like Filoni's in the in the control booth along with Henry Gilroy, and I said, "So Dave, are you going to be?" Uh, reading Chopper's lines against me, because Chopper has lines in the script, so you know how to <laughs> react to what he says. So he has actual dialogue, and they just cut that out. And, uh, and Dave's like, no, why would I be, uh, why would I be reading Chopper's lines? <laughs> Henry will read him for you. you know, that's, <laughs> you'll do fine. Henry's good. You know? He always pushes the buck off on Henry. Hey, uh, you know, we're here with you tonight because we wanted you to take a victory lap, a Clone Wars victory lap to celebrate the end of the series. But I do want to ask you one last question about Star Wars Rebels. Mm. And that would be the end of the Darth Maul story at uh, the, t you know, and it ended with uh, the tip of the blade of Obi-Wan Kenobi slicing through him. And you played Spoiler Ben Kenobi. Alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah, you Spoiler played Ben Come on, Kenobi. Guys, some people haven't seen that. They don't have Disney Plus yet. They don't have their <laughs> DVDs and their iTunes and their all, all them Netflixes. Yeah, you're always thinking about the people, GW. That's great. <laughs> That's right. Um, I could go back watching this mummy documentary, though. It's pretty good. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Keep him away from I, Tiger King. <laughs> he would, you know, uh, uh, GW would have gotten eight more years if he had uh, Baby Yoda running on the ticket with him. Oh, um, absolutely. But I, I wanted to, to ask you about uh, the honor of playing uh, Ben Kenobi in that final sequence and, uh, and, and how it resonated on you as a fan being there for that historic moment. Yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty amazing. You know, one of the, one of the advantages, I think, of, of, that I have as being a utility player on all these shows is I get to play such a wide range of characters. You know, part of the main cast, you know, you're usually that character and that's what the audience knows you as. So, you know, I've been very fortunate that I've been able to play, you know, every from everybody from Tarkin and, uh, you know, and Ben Kenobi from the original trilogy to, you know, the Masameda and the prequels and the new characters like you guys are bringing up. Everyone from Griff Halloran in Resistance mm -hmm. to Admiral Radis in Rogue One. Um so this was this was an this this was a great opportunity for me because I had been doing the voice uh, Alec Guinness's Ben Kenobi for Lucasfilm for years, going back to the early two thousands for all the video games and some projects that you know never came to fruition. I wish I could talk about some of those, but there was a lot of time. There was I was called on to do Guinness's voice for a lot of things, and uh, we happened to be recording an episode uh, of Rebels called Double Agent Droid, the one where AP Five sings. Mm. And um, during the while we were all getting set up, somebody started a conversation about Disney Infinity 3.0, and they said, "Ah, oh, you know, they pulled the plug on that game." And I said to Dave, "I said, oh, Dave, did you know that Mieber Gascon is in Disney Infinity?" And mm. Dave said, "No." He goes, "I didn't know." He goes, "Did you voice him in there?" I said, "No." I said, "He's one of these side mission characters that just has a little cartoon bubble. He doesn't talk." But I said, "I'd have gladly done the voice for him." I, I, I said, I just don't think they they knew. But I said, I was already there voicing Ben Kenobi for the game. And Dave said, oh, yeah. He goes, you do Ben Kenobi. He says, uh, let me hear a little bit of your Ben Kenobi. And so I'm like, okay. And then I immediately proceeded to forget every single line of dialogue Alan Guinness <laughs> has ever done in any of the movies. Instant audition right there exactly. on the spot. 
<laughs> exactly. But, but, but you start choking with brain farts and you start saying things like, do or do not, there is no try. Oh, wait, that's not him. Uh, wait, feed me. I need a line. Yes. Feed me a line. <laughs> You're a part of a rebel alliance and a traitor. Now that's somebody else. Oh, um, damn so it. Damn Vanessa it. Marshall was standing right next to me and she kind of whispers, she goes, do the scum and villainy line. I said, oh, yeah, great. And I'm like, how does it go? <laughs> and so. <laughs> So I finally remembered, you know, Moss Eisley Spaceport, you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. Ooh, wow. So Dave was like, perfect. Oh, perfect. That, that, <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> so wow. you know how it is. You guys are working radio and all that stuff. They, they, they let go of the talk back button and then you see them all talking to each other and <laughs> looking at my castmates. I wonder what that was all about. So the, uh, the session ends, and Filoni pulls me aside and says, I want to talk to you for a few minutes. He says, we have an idea for an episode. He says, we don't have a green light on it yet or anything. But he says, we have an idea for an episode that, will re- that I want to put the Alec Guinness uh, Kenobi character into. And he says, I wonder if you'd be up for maybe doing the scratch for it. He says, you'll probably end up being replaced. But he says, we want to you know, do this thing, do the scratch. You know, and I guess, you know, probably, maybe they were trying to prove what the episode could be, you know, because the character they had not brought into the animation yet was the Alec Guinness version of Kenobi. So I said, yeah, that sounds like a pretty cool idea. He says, so long as you're OK with, you know, you're probably being replaced at some point, you know, it could be a lot of fun. And up to that point, I had never worked with Sam Witwer on any episode in the Clone Wars. And I thought, no kidding. this could be a lot of fun. Yeah, we never had any scenes together, wow. you know. Um so uh, a couple of weeks went by, and I got a call from Dave, and he wanted to talk to me more about it and lay it out on the, on the line and said, you know, if you're, if you're up for it, you know, we'd, we'd love to have you, you know, do this uh, recording. So I went in, and uh, the way they recorded that day was, you've seen the episode. The rest of the cast from Rebels is in it. Um, but uh, they, they recorded everybody's bookends first, and then they left me in the room with Sam and, uh, and Taylor Gray, you know, was playing Ezra. And I was on his left, and Sam was on his right. And that's the way we stood in the room. So you had, you know, the devil and the angel on the shoulder kind of thing, pulling him from one, one side to the other. You know, so we did this thing and, uh, you know, had a lot of fun doing it. We played around with the scenes, uh, played around with the dialogue, played them multiple ways. Uh, you know, this is an episode that Dave Filoni himself wrote. So he knew exactly what it, what it was that he wanted. So we did it. Uh, I remember <laughs> they wouldn't let us keep our scripts, but we could keep our script covers. So I had everybody sign mine and everyone started passing theirs around. So we all had kind of a memento of the day. And believe it or not, I actually took photos that day because there was nobody there doing it. And my phone died and I lost every single one of the photos that I took from that day. Oh, <laughs> and, he, and I was on the phone to Verizon. I was trying to get. And they're saying, well, can you tell us what these photos are? I said, I cannot tell you anything about what these photos are. <laughs> especially if you're a star wars fan you know wow Um, so but anyway so um time went by and i had no idea what was going to happen with this thing and then um dave called me back and said i want to re-record some of the lines uh for the final scene between you know the death scene so we came back and i think i came back in twice and i believe one time only i changed just one word dave was really finessing this thing i remember at one point he he was talking to me about some of the lines that were written, which you don't hear because they've been excised. He, they decided less is more. And he was saying, he goes, I'm not sure if this is right, if this is something a Jedi would say. He goes, I may, he goes, I may have to talk to George about this and see what he thinks. I mean, that's how important he felt the dialogue was for that, that final sequence with him and Maul. So time goes by, and then I find out, get the call from Lucasfilm. They said, we have kept your dialogue in the film, in that episode. They said that, we'd, that everyone loved it. Um, they thought it would it worked perfectly, and there was no re- reason to recast. In fact, Dave told me he said he said hey, we were in the mixing room working on this or editing room, and he said people would come by and they say, well, well, would you dig up some old outtakes from Alec Guinness? Where'd you get this dialogue from? So anytime that uh, I hear something like that, where people don't realize it's me, that they think it's the original uh, actor that I'm voice matching, that is uh, that's golden for me. High that means praise just, for sure. You know that's. And, you know, so it, w- it was, it was uh, you know, a lot of fun to work on this. I mean, like I said, I had played that character so many times but never got a chance to put him in anything that was canon. And uh, so this was a 
just a wonderful opportunity for me to explore that character. And they gave him, you know, had so many, it's such great scenes with him and Ezra. I based a lot of that, the feeling of that based on, uh, Luke talking to, you know, the force ghost of Alec Guinness on the log there, you know, and oh. certain point of view, all these kinds of things. You know, that was the feeling that I was going for. The only way we could have made that better is if we would have been like, you know, had mobile mics so that we could have acted out the scenes, you know, moved around. I've done that on a couple of animated things where they've mic'd us and mic'd the room and we got to actually play the scene out. Mm. But uh, in lieu of, until that day comes and we start doing that on Star Wars, I, I'm really happy with the way that episode came out. I hope. What did you guys think? <laughs> oh, it, was, it was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it, it was one of those moments we were waiting for for quite a long time. Um, as they say many times in the dialogue, especially in these latest Clone Wars episodes, uh, Maul's a tough guy to kill. <laughs> you know, it's not <laughs> easy getting rid of him. And uh, But we felt like there needed to be some finality to his story prior to the events of the original trilogy kicking off. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was uh, when I when I think back to those episodes, the first things that pop into my mind image wise is uh, the the uh, rapid fire nature of that final duel um, and also the the last shot of young Luke running towards the Lars Homestead uh, household dome and uh, Ben watching him from off in the distance because it's that visual is something I always imagined. That, you know, Ben was doing that, keeping an eye on Luke. So I figured a, a scenario like that would have been kind of typical in Ben's day-to-day, uh, -day, week week-to-week operation. You know, well, it's as you go poke my head on the young Skywalker. And so he goes and looks at him. And yeah. so to, to actually see that, though, visually uh, in, the, in the animated realm was, was pretty cool. No, I, you know, I, I, I can't wait for the Kenobi series to come out because yeah. with Ewan McGregor, because I think we're really going to get to see more of what was going on. You know, what, it's one of the things that you know, I've talked about before is that you know, when, when Luke, when they do go to the cantina at Moss Eisley, um, first off, uh, Ben Kenobi is like, no one blinks. It's like he's been there before. He's a regular in this town, in this place. I mean, he knows that they all know him. Uh, you know, he goes up and starts talking to Chewbacca, presumably, and Wookiee. You know, he's having, he's understands him. They're having a conversation. When he slices that guy's arm off, everyone's kind of like, oh, yeah, it's the old man again. Yeah, don't mess with him. You know, so mm -hmm. obviously he has a reputation on uh, on Tatooine, you know. And uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get to see more of that. Like, how did he get that rep, you know, where nobody really messes with him, you know. And uh. he feels comfortable walking into that bar with all these outlaws. And they're not... And no one's picking a fight with him. They just kind of leave him be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know he has a history in that place because before he walks in there with Luke, he says, this place can be a little rough. And he's only saying that because he knows firsthand. Because right. Because he's exactly. experienced some of that roughness himself. Or maybe even distributed some of it. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm totally with you on that, Stephen. As a matter of fact, that's uh, you're, you're probably making me more excited for the Kenobi series than I've been in quite a while just hearing you talk about your anticipation for it. Um, there is uh, something we have been doing with our... Uh, Clone Wars core cast members uh, like yourself that we've had join us here on Rebel Force Radio over the course of the last couple months. And uh, that is the Yoda questionnaire. The Yoda questionnaire is a series of questions emailed to us by Jedi Master Yoda himself. And uh, I don't think we've ever asked you these questions before, Stephen. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um... Yeah, see, I don't well, think how, so. how would you know? You don't even know what the questions no. are. So <laughs> no. You wouldn't know until we start asking them. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah ask me when Feel I'll free let you to know stop if us. I, if if, ask, uh, all right, well, by, by the time we before. ask you the first one, yeah, forget I even <laughs> said that. By the time we ask you the first one, if, if, if you think we've asked you these questions in the past, just roll with it, okay? Just keep that to yourself. Okay. I have found, so, though, much like young Michael Mack used to ask you, Jim, who's your favorite Star Wars character today? Those answers yeah, right. change. Mm. From time to time, well, of so course. even if we have asked Stephen these questions before, I suspect that uh, they may have evolved. Mm -hmm. Morales, well, you know, evolved. The, Morale, <laughs> <laughs> well played, Swank. Well played. All right, so we sh let's get Star into the questions. Wars humor. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> are you ready, Stephen? Yes, I am ready. These are Stephen. these are sacred questions. 
Ah, from so the utmost, yeah, we must take uh, utmost sincerity with the answers. Um, Did you guys get these out of the tree before Yoda blew it up uh, with all the other Jedi texts? No, he emailed this to us. Oh, yeah. he emailed. Yeah, yeah. Yoda does have our I email guess. address, but he, oh. we, he won't give us his. He has it all. <laughs> it's <laughs> well, all he has, yeah. he yeah, has He's no high tech now. Either, so. He's yeah. high tech. All right, Mr. Stanton. What is yeah. or who is your favorite Star Wars character? Oh, Baby Yoda. I said Baby Yoda. Can I answer that? Baby Yoda. <laughs> Oh, everyone knows it's Baby Yoda. Mine's Horsehead Rebel Fighter. Uh, that's right. I forgot about the Horsehead Rebel. <laughs> I'm a so big if I'm in the Lando, if you can get the costume right, you know, the mustache, it's important. <laughs> so uh, the Horsehead Rebel well, is an got... actual Star Wars character who yeah. can be found by uh, doing a Google search, but it's uh, a, an X Wing pilot who has a horse head. Yeah, isn't and, he called uh, like yeah. Runt Equus or something like that? Is that close? That sounds about right. That yeah. sounds Runt. Yeah, yeah, something. <laughs> I could be wrong in that first name. But certainly not Runt. It's probably badass Equus. <laughs> <laughs> We've never Horse quite had the uh, the four for one Star Wars questionnaire well, <laughs> before. I don't know how long they can keep it up. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'll, I'll put my two cents in. You know, like you said, these things change. But you know, uh, one character that comes to my mind that I absolutely love, it's from the prequels. Dexter Jetster uh, ah. in his diner. Obi-Wan, you know, oh, them cloners, you got to watch out for them. That character is so well done. And what's his name? Uh, Ronald Falk plays him. Uh, he's, I believe, he's an Australian actor. I think he's just one of the one of the more fun characters they have. And plus, it has once again has that sort of American graffiti vibe to it. Um, sure, you know that uh, comes up in uh, in so much. Actually, we had you know in our we had a kind of a we had an American graffiti scene that was cut. Well, Jimmy Mac left. It says what? It says Jimmy Mac left on my screen. No, I'm here. I'm here, guys. Oh, I'm oh, here. There he is. I was going to say. I'm here. The, I'm here. Uh, I was going to just kind of call, call back to the Clone Wars arc that we just did. I there was a scene that we originally recorded that was straight out of American Graffiti. I played a uh, a used car salesman that sells Ahsoka Tano that crummy bike that she that breaks down. It was right out of it's just like the scene where uh, the character of Toad in American Graffiti is being confronted by that sleazy used car dealer. And um, uh, I remember I, I used it to get a THX 1138 reference in there. Because you know how George used to slip a, an 1138 reference into all his movies? Sure. So I had told her, I said, lady, please, you know, the 1138's a classic. This thing is going to give you no, you know, it's <laughs> going to be fine. You know, whatever. And then it breaks down. And we always used to wait next week when, when you're waiting to see if you got the, the post-it notes from from. George Lucas saying he wanted you to change a line or redo a line or whatever. And I was waiting for us, and Dave Filoni didn't mention anything about re-recording the line. So I thought, ah, oh, finally going to get a, a THX 1138 reference in there. So, but it ended up getting cut. So, oh. Well, you can't win them all. He's, he's a good character. I won't tell you the name because I hope they used the character one time. It was really funny. So hmm. Dexter Jetster. That is yes. a first. And I love when we have a first here. Um, mm-hmm. I, my Radio. favorite thing about Dex is he's got four arms, and so when he goes in to hug Obi Wan Kenobi, <laughs> his uh, his lower right hand scratches his ass. <laughs> uh, Do you so guys weird. know how they filmed? Do you have any? I've never seen any behind the scenes. Do, who was who was standing there in front of? Uh, it was Ernest Borgnine. Board. No, it was no. not. It was uh, <laughs> it was the actual actor. Uh, what, what, he says yes. him was Ronald Falk. I, I think yeah. it was. Yeah. And um, yeah. And so they shot the sequences with him on set, uh, and then they shot them without him actually there. Uh, so you and McGregor was miming the hug and things of that nature, and so they uh, had they had two different uh, pieces of uh, uh, film to work with when it came time then to animate in the character. Yeah. That yeah. stuff's tough to do when you don't have. Uh, I've done a, f a little bit of green screen, and I did really old school motion capture where I actually had to wear an exoskeleton. You know, I had about six feet of cable behind me. You couldn't really move around much, but you're mimicking things and you know, you know, doing more pantomime than anything else. Wow, it's tough stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, are you ready for question number two? Yes, absolutely. All right. Now we're going to, we went to the light side of the force. Now we're going to go to the dark side as I mm. ask you who your least favorite Star Wars character is. Mm. Oh, that one's easy. Least favorite. <laughs> Jackson. 
Jackson. Oh, the rabbit. Thank the you. Well, I love but, this answer. Because, you know, we put his skeleton in the uh, in the Mieber Gascon arc. He's the That's skeleton right. that you find by the record. Yeah. The- <laughs> that was my favorite part of that episode. <laughs> it was a lot of people at Lucasfilm's favorite part, too, I think. <laughs> Jay, Dave had great glee showing me that uh, pre-production drawing. When he says, do you know who Jackson is? I said, mm-hmm. yeah. He goes, take a look at this picture and tell me what you think. And he says, like, we're, we're kind of showing his skeleton there. Well, oddly, fandom and the franchise itself, the Star Wars saga, hadn't really uh, thought much about Jackson since he last appeared in a Marvel comic back in 1978. And he's kind of just been this running joke among fandom, you know, Bugs Bunny and Star Wars. Weird. But, uh, and we thought it was weird back in the 70s, too. And the 70s, the 70s were weird to begin with. So, um, Jackson didn't last long, but uh, recently there has been something of a Jackson renaissance. He's appeared in some IDW comics, and he's appeared in some recent Marvel comic issues as well. I so, personally uh, kind of like him because he's green like Yoda. Everything green, Yoda green, baby yeah. Yoda green, Jackson green. I love it. He's green. Money. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course. All right. Good answer so far. Good answer so far. You've gotten them all right. Oh, good. Thank yeah, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Is there uh, a prize at the end? Like whiskey? <laughs> or nice, uh, scotch. At least. We'll get you some Maybe scotch. Sir, sure. All right. All right. Uh, Mr. Stanton or Mr. Connery or Mr. W. Bush or uh, Mr. Uh, Walken. Walken. The name's Walken. Like Walken. Walken. I, 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 no. no. It's, it's hard to keep up sometimes. Uh, what is. I'll remind you, it's okay. Well, Jason has a hard time thinking with his grandfather's uh, watch up his ass. What? That's not need to it, go there. We didn't need to go there. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Jason, program, you know. What is that supposed to mean? You see, I knew it, Jason. I knew you've never seen Pulp Fiction. I knew you've never seen it. No, I hate yeah. Quentin Tarantino movies. You hate Quentin Tarantino oh, movies. Yeah, he's terrible. Okay, we better move on from this subject <laughs> right away. We're starting to get kind of salty here. Yeah. I think we ought to move on. <laughs> All right. Question number three. What Star Wars scene makes you smile? Oh, another easy one. Um, (laughs) And I have the action figure to go along with this scene. Will Roe Hood running out of the uh, Sky City with his ice cream container. (laughs) That's a great one. That's like an ice cream maker. You guys know that, Jason? Yeah. Are you not familiar with the no? Hood? I, I, hey, I may not. Knows, I may Jason not know Pulp know Fiction, but I do Quentin know. Tarantino. But I Jason do know doesn't know about, Jack about Quentin Tarantino. But he knows a about Empire Strikes Back. On that actor, they're going to find him and do a documentary. It'll be on Disney Plus next year. <laughs> Disney Gallery: The Tales of Will Row Hood. Well, we know that that's a Camtomo. Camtono. Now, right, because so we've seen that in The Mandalorian right, now, right? Yeah, that's yes. right. So I guess you could put ice cream in it. I don't know. They were putting other I stuff. I put in ice it. cream in mine. I like a little cherry vanilla, a little tutti frutti. <laughs> I like pistachio, though. Guess why? Guess why I like pistachio, guys? Why? Because you're a little nuts? Green. little nuts. It's green. It's green. Oh, green. Oh, oh, okay. We're that makes sense. You're kind of the uptake, aren't you? <laughs> I'm going to go watch that mummy documentary again. I'll yeah, wait. Go, <laughs> go do that. What? <laughs> All right. We got just two more questions here for you. You're doing really good so far. Okay. Um, what Star Wars? Here. What Star Wars scene always makes you sad? Uh, let's see. Um, oh, I, well, I'll tell you. It comes from a movie that I use more Kleenex in than any other Star Wars film. Uh, that is. Uh, Rogue One it shed so many tears in that film. I think the the sacrifice of Chirrut and Baze, the, mm-hmm. the the char- those two characters, and the, the love and loyalty they have towards one another that is just heartbreaking to watch. To see those guys, you know, give their lives up for, you know, the rebellion in that in that scene. Right, and the, the way Chirrut walks out into the battlefield as the blaster bolts are flying all around, and he is essentially protecting himself with nothing but his faith as he goes through his mantra i am one with the force and the force is with me i am with the force what is the mantra i am one <laughs> with the force and the force is with me. that's one of my yeah, favorite I'm one lines, with the force actually. and the force is with me i'm one I was with the glad force glad to see that force. come up in the clone wars when Ahsoka Tano pays uh, tribute to that movie by uh, yes yeah that's a, that's a great line great line great line great moment great movie 
All right, we got one more here for you, okay? Mm. This is a tough one. This is the toughest one of all. Steven Stanton, if there was another Star Wars movie to be made, you were cast in it, and George Lucas was the director, what would you like to hear him say to you after he says, cut on your final scene? We need more cowbell. I think that's what I'd like to hear. I'd like to see we need more baby Yoda. Put more baby Yoda. Put baby Yoda in every nook and cranny. Just fill it with baby Yoda. Wow. I've never found the 43rd president of the United States to be as likable and as... Uh, 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 just on point. Just uh, on point. Yeah, right. It was sharp. He's extremely <laughs> sharp tonight. I am I'm sharp. Uh, I got look. You know what? I'm as sharp as that. You know that Crayola box with the sharpener in the back. That's me. I'm sharp. I'm a yeah. sharp crayon. Yeah, we stuck you right <laughs> in there crayon. and twisted it. <laughs> yeah, we we yeah stuck you right in there. I'd like to, I'd it. like to hear George Lucas say martini shot. <laughs> <laughs> martini shot. That's kind of what you say. It, it's the last scene of the day. It's the martini shot. Martini shot. Oh, oh, I see. I see yes. the martini shot. That's yes. cool. That's Cleared cool. your think, mind. Yeah. <laughs> we might so, have uh, to start incorporating that. Yeah. If it was, yeah. If I, if I worked on a film one time when they said they, the director was a guy named Larry, and they said, well, you know, Larry likes to have a martini after every shot. I'm like, what? He goes, no, no. I mean, he likes to have the martini shot at the end of the day. And sorry, sorry. I said, well, yeah. <laughs> I said, no wonder this film is coming out the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of focus and shot Larry! after every shot. If it was me in this uh, hypothetical yeah. Star Wars, mm -hmm. film, I would go back to what I mentioned earlier. I would just say George Lucas. If George Lucas says something like, "Moving on," if you don't get any notes from George Lucas, that means he is happy. He Ooh. is ready to go to the next shot. Yes. So that's what I learned from working on Clone Wars. If George Lucas doesn't say anything, you're good to go. Nice. That's awesome. Well. Stephen Stanton, this has been awesome. It's been a long time coming. We're so glad to uh, have welcomed you back onto the program. And uh, anytime you want to come back, you're always welcome here at Rebel Force Radio. Thanks so much. Yeah, there's, you know, I've got definitely got things in the works uh, coming up that you guys will probably want to talk about. Ah. Uh, obviously, I can't say what uh what oh, I, there's one thing that i can talk about it's, it, and it's actually somewhat star wars related amongst some of the projects uh that i've been working on uh you know like right now i'm doing a a series on uh, for disney plus called monsters at work uh that's going to be coming out next year but i did a uh there's a they did a are you did you guys remember watching the the new scooby-doo movies back in the 70s where they would have celebrities oh, come on to scooby-doo all the time and, the, and, they, and, and boomerang's got Harlem, a whole Harlem Globetrotters. New, you got it yeah so they, boomerang's they, got a bunch of new ones i saw they yes. met urkel last season yes and they've got one in season two that i'm in where i play mark hamill's high school coach and his drama teacher he goes back to a reunion in japan a high school reunion. Yeah. And let me tell you something. I've seen this thing. It is absolutely hilarious. And anything that you can think of that is related to Mark Hamill and fandom, they found a way oh to include God. it in yeah. this in this episode. It's when one of the funniest happen? things. When does this uh, happen? This, they released it in the UK already, but it's coming out on season two uh, for Boomerang. Um, so if you're a Boomerang subscriber, you'll be able to see it. I think in the UK it might be on it's broadcast. It's great. I, I am a Boomerang subscriber. I watched every episode last season of the, the new Scooby-Doo movies. Uh, so finally, my life will be complete. I'll get to hear Shaggy yes. say, today, Scooby-Doo meets Mark Hamill. Right, Sweet. it is. And, it's, and I, you know, I've, I've got to do a, n a number of these for season two. I've probably done like a half a dozen of them. And one of my, the greatest thing for me is being able to play the character in some cases where I get to say, and I'd have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for these meddling kids. Ooh, you guys and then you say, say the name of the name of the celebrity, you know, and you know, I don't want to give away who we did in season two, but uh, I think you guys are going to enjoy the Mark Hamill episode. Oh, this sounds amazing! This sounds so. Called, uh, so Scooby Doo and Guess Who is the name of that's it. That's right. The, right. The, the old one was the Scooby Doo movies, right? Um, with Jonathan Winters. And, yeah. Yeah. And they did and they, uh, season one. They wrapped it up with uh, Kevin Conroy coming back as Batman. It was fantastic. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. No, they've, they've done some great stuff. I thought the Penn and Teller one was really funny. <laughs> was uh, they've good. done some really fun. And then they had the one, in the, one of the first ones had like Speed Buggy and Funky Phantom, and they threw all kinds of Hanna Barbera stuff into the mix. So old school, I, old school. Yeah, but the Mark Hamill and Mark, so Mark came in and did his voice on it, and it was, it was, it's just fall over funny. 
Well, I got to see this. If anyone is in our UK audience and you happen to have a a file of this particular episode, you could send us here at Rebel Force Radio. I want to review this. Mark Hamill, Stephen Stanton together in a (laughs) Scooby-Doo episode? You got to be kidding me. Yeah. And I there's one able to see this. There's one other thing I'd like to mention to you guys that I that uh, it's uh, something that's been around for for a while. It's it uh, it's um, it's close to my heart. It's a project that's close to my heart. So uh, a while back, I recorded as a radio play the entire classic novel Treasure Island, and I put it up on yes. YouTube for free. There's 34 chapters, are commercial free, and we did it with the intent of making it available to students who were assigned this book. Uh, particularly AP English students. And, uh, you know, it's been doing great. And all of a sudden, during lockdown, this thing started going crazy with the number of hits and the comments we would see every day. So a lot of, uh, a lot of kids are reading Treasure Island for their, uh, their homeschooling. And, um, and it's just taken off like wildfire. I mean, my YouTube channel, it had a good amount of hits, but, you know, all of a sudden the views went over a million and Treasure Island oh, wow. was like 750,000 of those used for the Treasure Island chapters. And uh, so I just wanted to pass it along to your audience. If you've got kids at home, whether you're just looking for something to, to entertain yourself or if they've got, you know, if they've been assigned Treasure Island as a book to read for AP English or any other class, um, head on over to YouTube. There's a playlist there. Mm-hmm. Like I said, all 34 chapters. I do all 30 <laughs> characters in the uh, in the um, um in the book, so I came up with, and there's some in there. If you're a Star Wars fan, you're going to hear some characters that may sound familiar to some of my Star I think Wars we, characters. I think we might have a clip here. I would see him in a thousand forms and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of creature who had never had but the one leg, and that in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over the hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. And altogether, I paid pretty dear for my monthly fourpenny piece. I, I have to be. confess that I have uh, that book always intimidated me a bit. Uh, it was a little girthy, and I've never read it. Well, you know, I'm not it the is reader, a tough you know. read. <laughs> it's a very tough read because not only is the language antiquated, it uses a lot of vernacular that has to do with s- seafaring voyages mm. and pirates. And I had to really go through, you know, it took me a year and a half to actually record it in my spare time. And uh, it's it's not an easy. I think a lot of kids, uh, you know, they um, they choose it because they think it's going to be easy. Maybe they've seen a movie or whatever, and then they get into it and they're like, "Wow, this is deep." And like I said, with like thirty characters in there, uh, you know, and keeping track of all the different pirates and buccaneers and stuff, I really had to have a master list so I knew how to do every chapter. Uh, but it was a lot of fun to do. It's been very rewarding. And, you know, one of the things they found is that if kids are reading along while they're listening to it, uh, their comprehension is that much better. Yes. So mm. we always suggest that to the kids. Read read along as you're listening to it. Yes, yes. The words then come to life on the page, really. And uh, I'm looking at your YouTube channel, Stephen Stanton on YouTube. You have almost a quarter million views on uh, each and every chapter. And, Stephen, I don't want you to be offended by Jason talking about the book the way he did because he just hates Robert Louis Stevenson as much as he hates Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> it's That's true. Well, you know, yeah, you ought to read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That's a Robert Louis Stevenson novel as well. There you go. Yes. I've narrated it myself, but it's hard to tell the difference between Hyde and Jekyll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you know what? It's hard to um, identify you in these narrations because you get completely lost in the character. We know a lot of voiceover actors and we've talked to a ton of them over the years here on rebel force radio, but Steven, you are the one guy who I have the hardest time identifying because you get lost in your character so much. I do not hear Steven Stanton. That's good. Thank you so much. That yes. makes me feel uh, it warms my heart to hear that because that's the whole idea is to forget who it is that you're listening to or not even. In fact, I had a friend of mine who works in uh, visual effects. I mean, he's a sculptor and a creature creator. And he messaged me on Instagram not that long ago and was saying, he goes, you know, I'm sitting there in the studio looking for something. I got this treasure island. He goes, I'm about 15 chapters in. He goes, I'm thinking to myself, man, this is really really wild and well done and like who's the guy and is it he's is he playing all the characters and he said oh he said oh my god it's you he says i had no idea that i was listening to you the whole time and this is a person that i've known for years 
Yeah, it's amazing. And of course, we travel together to Salt Lake City and uh, Park City, Utah for Sundance back in 2013 to support the Roger Ebert documentary in which you did all of the narration as Roger Ebert. And this is well after the man lost the ability to communicate and then passed on. And mm -hmm. here you are narrating his life story in front of, there's a packed theater watching this for the very first time, including Roger Ebert's widow, including a person like me who's worked with Roger Ebert when he was alive. And I don't think there was a single person sitting in that theater who second guessed that narration. It was Roger talking from the grave. And the way you were able to do that was magic. And that's the type of stuff Stephen Stanton, you bring to every role you play. And I think you're a, a, an exceptional, rare talent in the voiceover field. And I'm very happy to call you a friend. Well, thank you. And then, you know, that particular film was is absolute highlight of, of my career. And I'm so glad that you and your wife, Wendy, mm -hmm. uh, were able to join us there for that because uh, it really was, like I said, <laughs> talk about a career pinnacle. And when you do something like that, that it means so much to the people that were involved in the film, including Chaz, Roberts, you know, Roger's wife, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, and it was great to work with Steve James, the director. Yes. He had done Hoop Dreams. He's a wonderful director and very understanding. And, um, but yeah, I had so much fun with you guys and at Sundance that, uh, is, we've got a lot of good pictures to show actually how much of a good time we had, uh, at that, yes. that, that event. Yeah. So it was my first time at Sundance too. I'd never been before. So it was great to be able to have you there. And like I said, Wendy and my managers, Dutch and Kathy, and, you know, just everybody that was along for that. Yeah, me and Dutch were just talking about it last night and sharing some uh, good old memories and talking about how we should put some of those pictures up on Instagram. And for all of our listeners out there who are curious, the film is called Life Itself. It's a documentary about the life of film cr critic Roger Ebert and narrated in the voice of Roger Ebert by Stephen Stanton himself. Stephen, thank you again for this great uh, Clone Wars victory lap, as we like to call it, as we get the core cast members of that great legendary show to join us here on rebel force radio and share some great memories. Well, thank you guys. You know, I never would have anticipated where getting on that show back in season two, where it would have led me and, and would have allowed me to meet not only people like yourself, but all the fans and, that I've met over the years, whether it's at celebration or other cons, such some wonderful incredibly incredibly talented people and very generous people in the star wars community they've helped out with all of our charity events they've always shown up for them and uh so yeah it's been uh it's been um you know it's 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 been a great just a great adventure all the way through from one end to the other so and i hope to i hope it continues for a while doing other things uh you never know what's around the corner with star wars and lucasfilm but uh either way being part of clone wars has just been fantastic or you never know what's coming up with star wars and scooby-doo so uh we're pretty excited about that <laughs> too true. i know i am i can't i can't stop thinking about it so thank you so much steven thanks a lot guys i really appreciate it and jason it's good to see you and talk to you because i know I, I i probably see or talk to jimmy more than i get a chance to talk to you so it was great to uh, hear most your people voice do. And, and see you <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you too, my friend. Take care. Okay. Take care, right. guys. Bye-bye.